and camera. Hello, welcome to NAFA Live. I'm your host, Zach Hules. We have two great speakers lined up for you this morning from our host location in Des Moines, Iowa. Now, some of you are joining us virtually or from one of the 18 watch locations across Iowa, Minnesota, and North Dakota. So let's just take a moment and see who's all out there. Give us a wave. Hey, hi everyone. Welcome to your NAFA meeting. Now, before we begin, I do have a few housekeeping items to go over. So today we have two CE credits that are approved for members in Minnesota, North Dakota, and Nebraska, and one CE credit who, that has been approved for members in Iowa. If you're participating from a NAFA um, we have a qualified proctor on site to monitor, document, and testify to your 100% completion of the course. And for those of you joining us virtually with the intention to earn CE credit, you must remain present for the duration of the program. Throughout the program, polling questions will appear on your screen. You'll have two minutes to answer them in order to attain the CE credit. Now, the first polling question for individual viewers is, how many years have you been in the business? How many years have you been in the business? Please use the polling function on your screen to respond. You have two minutes. Now, NAFA Live will be held every month, so please mark your calendar for the next meeting on March 21st hosted again by NAFA Iowa. This meeting will feature Rick Cordero of Principal Financial Group. The topic of Rick's session will be Income Protection Solutions, also known as Disability Insurance. Now it is my pleasure to turn the program over to NAFA Iowa President Clint Hinderrocker, who will introduce our first speaker today. Clint? Thank you, Zach. And welcome NAFA members in Iowa, Nebraska, North Dakota, and Minnesota. NAFA Iowa is pleased to host the second in a series of monthly NAFA Live events. Now, without further ado, I'd love to introduce our first speaker, Marv Feldman, CEO of Life Happens. Thank you. Well, this is a different experience to be talking to one group here and a whole bunch of people elsewhere that I can't see. So when you wave, just remember, I can't hear you, I can't see you, but if you wanna ask a question, I'm sure somebody can figure out how to get that done. Uh, today, I don't really want to stand here and just talk to you. What I really wanna do is to talk with you. So as I'm going through this presentation, I've made allowances for you to ask questions. And if you ask a question, I am going to be handing out some books that you may be able to use in your practice. One is one that I wrote, and one is from the Life Happens organization. So let's get started if we could, and we'll go to the next slide. And the reason I'm showing this is, how many of you have had a terrible, no good, rotten, horrible day? Just a show of hands. You know, when you wanna go home and kick the dog, but you can't because it's a Doberman? <laughs> this is one of our social media slides from Life Happens. And this is what I think about when I'm having a terrible, no good, rotten day, and that is that chocolate is good, life happens really helps. What I'd like to do now is to show you a video that we created last year. It, it was premiered at the NAFA meeting. It's called Life is for Living. This is really an emotional video that you can use with your clients and your prospects to help it's them understand insurance. what insurance is all about. How about a book? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that one again. Life is for living. Make sure you live it well. Jump in puddles, play in dirt, dress up like a baboon having a tea party in a skirt. <laughs> now, there may come a time when I'm no longer here. But just remember that life is for living. So be of good cheer. And if you're reading this, that must mean that I'm gone. But don't be sad. Because life is for living. And you must live on. You'll be okay, Buck. Hmm? We both will. The video talks about what insurance does, not what it is. And you'll notice she was holding a book. We had so many people and so many companies that came to Life Happens and said, we want to buy the book. Well, there never was a book. That was just a prop that was created for the movie. However, we now have the books. They're available on Amazon. They run about six bucks a piece. This is a great tool to use for young families. You send them the video. It's on YouTube where you can send them to the Life Happens site, lifehappens.org. And then go in with this book to leave with them. And there's place in here for the family to write personal notes to their children. I'm going to be passing these out as people ask questions, although you will have to come up to get it. But this brings us to the point of a thought to ponder. And one of the things I learned a long time ago is that you have to learn from the mistakes of others. The reason you have to do that is you can't possibly live long enough to make all the mistakes yourself. I learned that the hard way. Now, one of the other thoughts to ponder is this. When punishing kids, don't take their electronics, take their charger and watch the agony as their battery slowly dies. <laughs> Just a thought to ponder. So my question to you is, how do you approach your prospects? What is your method of first contact? You know, it's difficult to get in to see people today because they all have gatekeepers. They've got voicemail. They've got the internet. And they've got the intervention of, of other advisors and alternate distribution systems. All the things that keep us out. They have a very high level of defense. And they really don't want to talk to us because we haven't developed the level of trust that we need to earn their business. And that's what's important. We have to earn the trust before they will do business with us. So why will they do business with us? Why would they buy from you? John, why would they buy from you? Clint, why would they buy from you? Because you have to earn the trust. You have to connect with them emotionally, emotionally. If you do, they will trust you with their story, and they will trust you with their money. Remember, it's emotions first, it's numbers and statistics that confirm that decision. If there's no emotional buy-in at the beginning, they're not going to purchase what you're recommending, no matter what it is. Emotional buy-in is critical. So here's an example of what Life Happens can do for you in developing that emotional buy-in. This is one of our real life stories from last year. Dory and I have two sons. Our oldest is Burke and our youngest is Talon. And they are spirited kids. Dory is fantastic. She is the most wonderful person that I know. So when we first got married, uh, as part of me being in the industry, we had life insurance, critical illness insurance, and disability insurance in place. Ironically enough, the first claim I paid out to a client for critical illness or disability insurance was my wife. Not long after my son Burke turned uh, one, uh, Dory started experiencing headaches 
and they got quite severe and she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And the only option we had is to do surgery. It was a four hour surgery. The neurosurgeon says, well, it wasn't what we thought it was. It wasn't uh, a, a brain tumor. It was a cavernous angioma, the malformation of blood vessels. And in Dory's situation, they started to bleed. So once Dory was released, she was part of a rehabilitation program. And that's when we discovered that she had suffered stroke and lost her right peripheral vision in both eyes. Now she couldn't drive anymore. So being 27 years old, giving up your independence uh, was also very crushing and you know emotionally difficult. I'm grateful every day that she's here. She had some cognitive issues that came up through the process. I now have to help Dory with certain things that she needs, something as simple as you know going for groceries. He asked me, how is the insurance important? It was a miracle for us. So having the disability insurance helped to replace a portion of her income. And also the critical illness paid a lump sum that helped us to ease any other financial stress, it helped us to move closer to family so we could have the support we needed. It gave us peace of mind to have the insurance in place when we needed it the most. And for that, I'll be forever grateful. Insurance and action stories. Insurance about stories about what insurance does, not what it is. Most of these are, are posted on YouTube for you to use. The rest of them are on the lifehappens.org site. But once again, these are the types of things you should be sending to your clients and prospects in preparation for an interview because you want them to be in the right mindset. Remember, it's an emotional decision. Which brings up the point of prospecting. Just a show of hands, how many of you enjoy prospecting? Oh, one person, two people. You wanna work for me? Because I hate to prospect. You know, I'm one of those people that have severe call reluctance. Now you wouldn't think that, especially after 53 years. But I really hate picking up the phone and making phone calls. When I pick up the phone, that stupid phone gets teeth. I was gonna say something else, but that stupid phone <laughs> It gets teeth and clamps onto my ear and I'm afraid it's never gonna let go. Now, when I get through the first phone call or two, I'm fine, but I really don't like to do it. But we have to remember that we have some goals that we have to keep in mind for prospecting. And there are four basic prospecting goals. One, one I've already said it, we wanna educate about what insurance does. We wanna create increased awareness of the problems it needs solved. It's problem solution. We want to motivate for a call to action. Problem, we have a solution. And we want to build trust and confidence. Those are the four goals that you keep in mind when you're doing prospecting. Now, the next question is how many of you do referrals? How many of you ask for referrals? You know, a number of you. Question for the rest of you, why don't you ask for referrals? Somebody just spit out an answer. Okay, you don't know why you're not asking for referrals because nobody said anything. I can tell you why I don't ask for them. I'm always afraid that people are gonna say no. I don't want to ask because I don't want to get a no. I have really thin skin and I take a no personally. What I found is there are other ways to ask for the referral and I've got some of them listed here. So instead of saying, who do you know, it's who do they buy the materials from? Who are their suppliers? Who provides their IT service? Who's their main competition? And then after you get a list of names, because they'll give you those names, you ask for a letter of introduction. The letter of introduction is, this is Mark Feldman. I've recently done some business with him. I don't know if you can use his services, but I think you should really get to know him a little bit better. He will be calling. That's all I want, and it's on the letterhead of the client. And I then follow up, make the phone call. Yes, I do make those types of phone calls. And try to get that appointment and make sure that the client knows that if the individual says, I have no interest, that I will not pursue it, I will not do anything that would harm our relationship. 
This is a very easy way to get the referrals. It works very, very well. The letter of introduction was actually published within the Advisor Today magazine some years ago, so it's probably still in the archives, but you can also get it off of my, out of my book that I wrote for MDRT a couple of years ago. Anybody here do cold calls? A few, the young lady right there. Good for you, good for you. I used to do that when I was training New York Life people. I was a manager for New York Life for five years. You have to do things you don't really wanna do. So I made cold calls back then, but it does require courage and thick skin. So I knew I needed to develop a prospecting system that worked for me when I was out doing other things. So developing a prospecting system is critical to our success. Question, how many of you have been in a slump over the years? Probably everybody. The reason we get into a slump is we've been working really hard, building that funnel, putting the names in, working those cases, getting them through, getting them placed. But while we're doing that, we stop prospecting. Think about how you work. And there are no new names going into that funnel. So we need to develop a system that works for you all the time. One of the things that I used many years ago was direct mail. Most people have stopped using it. Although I will tell you from the research that I've recently seen, the direct, excuse me, the direct mail responses have increased significantly because there are so few people doing it today. And the people that I know that are still doing it are having great success. You've got to purchase a mailing list. You've got to purchase the right type of mailing list. Internet marketing, a lot of people doing internet marketing. And of course, social media. Social media is one of the keys today. Millennials today will look you up on the internet. If you don't have a viable website, they're not gonna do business with you. It's really critical that you have that. It's critical that you're involved in all these things that they do. Now, I have a website, but I don't do social media because I didn't wanna to have to deal with New York Life's compliance people for it, so I just don't bother with it. So my social media is all personal, not business related. But when I was doing prospecting, I had a specific program that I used. I was sending out pre-approach letters, not just a cold letter, but a pre-approach letter. And I purchased a list from Dun & Bradstreet. Everybody know what Dun & Bradstreet is? Okay. And I wanted a list geographically around where I lived in Ohio at that time that were closely held businesses, not public corporations, that, was doing, that were doing at least five million a year in sales and had at least 15 or more employees. So let me give you the reasoning for that. Number one, I wanted a closely held business so that when they said, I have to go talk to my board of directors, the owner of the company could walk out of the hall, talk to himself, come back in and give me a decision. Takes a few minutes as opposed to a few months when you're working with a public corporation. Public corporation, figure six months to two years to close a case. Five, five million a year in sales. There's a rule that I used, and that is that most companies, not all, but most, have about a 10% profit margin. So if I've got a company doing a half a million a year, excuse me, five million a year in sales, I've got a half a million dollars of cash available that they can use for new people, they can use for plan improvements, they can use for R&D, they can use for raises, they can use to fund the solutions that I'm going to present. I don't need to find the money, the money is there. It's now a matter of how are they going to allocate the funds. So somebody can have a problem, but if they have no money, you can't solve that solution. Sometimes you get them to buy term. Term is great. Term is my inventory of future business. I write lots of term and I convert lots of term because I'm trying to solve permanent problems, not temporary problems. 15 or more employees because I wanted these companies to have other issues other than business succession or estate planning. I wanted them to have key person, used to call it key man, not anymore for the ladies, key person insurance. These are people that are critical to the success of the company. These are people that we wanna provide golden handcuffs to. We wanna make sure they don't leave. We make it expensive for them to leave. But if something happens to that person, how is it going to impact the success of the company? 
And we have a real life story, life happens about that. Somebody was killed on a private plane. And he was the rainmaker for the company. But we had key men, not we, but there was key man insurance that was involved. And what we try to do in those situations is we say, what is one year's profit for your company? It's a half a million, it's a million, it's two million, it's $5 million a year, that's our profit. What would happen if John or Jill were no longer here? How would it impact that profitability? Well, we'd lose X amount of money. Well, let's ensure one year's worth of profits. If something happens to Jill, we'll make sure that one year's worth of profit comes in to fund you during that time when you need to go through the transitions. The cost is only pennies on the dollar. Let me explain how it works. So we found a problem, now we're presenting the solution. So we're going to ensure a year's profits. When you're working in the business markets, there are so many different problems that they have that we can provide solutions to. Many times they don't know that they have a problem until we make them aware of it. Phone calls to follow up. I told you that I don't like to make phone calls. We were sending out 50 letters a week if they put them on my desk to make the calls, but by the time I'd get around to them, they have, would have turned yellow because I hate making phone calls that much. So I hired a young lady who sounded absolutely magnificent on the phone to make all the phone calls. And the pre-approach letter we were sending out said, my name is Mark Feldman. I represent the Feldman Financial Group. We have some products and services that we provide that may be unique and profitable to you. I'd like to take 20 minutes to explain to you what we do. That's all the letter said. Sometimes we'd send out something a little unique and different. So for a while we were sending out a $2 bill. Anybody have a $2 bill in the wallet today or have seen them? You know, if you wanna tip somebody, tip them a $2 bill. Instead of giving them two ones, you'll be amazed at the difference in the reaction you get when you give them a $2 bill. It's just phenomenal. And we got that same reaction when we mailed these letters out. The $2 bill is unique and different. So are the products and services we provide. Let me tell you about them. We did have some issues with the $2 bill. Occasionally we'd send it out. My, my gal would help call me and say, hey, you know, this person got the letter, there was no $2 bill in it, he wants another. <laughs> we'd send him another. So then I told her, staple all the $2 bills in so they don't get lost. And then when they said your $2 bill wasn't there, we'd say, well, is there a staple or a staple mark in the letter? And they say, yeah. And we say, well, somebody on your staff has the $2 bill. And then I thought to myself, because I'm relatively smart, I said, hey, let's just put a staple in and send it out without the $2 bill. Look at all the money we can save. <laughs> Didn't actually do that, but I did think about it. Uh, we also sent out the dollar Sacagawea gold coin. Once again, it's unique and different. And we also use the million dollar bills, which I'm gonna show you here in a little bit, which cost about 15 cents a piece. The million dollar bill is unique and different. Now, when you use the million dollar bill, you may have some compliance issues because the security side might say, well, you're telling them that, that you're gonna give them a guarantee of success. That's not the case. So every compliance office is different. I was able to use them. Some companies won't let people use them, but the million dollar bills are great. And if we have time, I'll tell you a story about the million dollar bills. The only problem I had with this system, we lived in a little town in Ohio. At the time I was growing up, there were 25,000. Today, there's only 8,000 people there. But all of our prospects were 50 to 100 miles away. So we had Cleveland on one side and we had Pittsburgh on the other. It's a 100 mile drive between the two, maybe a little bit longer. And the problem I was having is she wasn't paying attention to the zip codes when she was making the phone calls. So she'd make a morning appointment in Pittsburgh and then she'd make an appointment for late morning or early afternoon in Cleveland. And then she'd make another appointment back in Pittsburgh. And finally I said, stop, don't do this anymore. Check the zip codes, only call this zip code for this day. <laughs> so we, we got the, the tribe time down to a more reasonable level. But she was so efficient and the goal was to make two new appointments per week. That's all I really wanted to fit into my schedule was two new appointments per week. And we generated some beautiful cases from these. And it was really, truly amazing. One quick story, and then I'll move on. She made an appointment for me for an HVAC company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. One of the largest ones in the state of Pennsylvania. I went in, I talked to them. 
talked about all the different things and they said, there's nothing you can help us with. We've done everything, including all of our estate planning. And I said, well, do you have enough confidence in your advisors to allow me to give you a review of your estate planning documents? I won't charge you a fee because I'm fee-based plus commissions. And they said, sure. He opens up the drawer, he pulls out the documents, he hands them to me and I'm looking at them. And every single document is stamped draft, has never been signed, they're two years old. I said, I think we have a problem here. You've got the documents, they're two years old, the estate planning laws have changed, these were never executed. Do I have permission to call your attorney? They gave me permission. The attorney said, we've been trying to get them to do this for two years, how did you get them to think about it again? So I asked for permission to work with the attorneys. We had all new documents drafted. We got all the documents signed. It generated a six figure premium from one pre-approach letter. It works well if you work the system. And this is a system that worked for me when I was out doing everything else. Life Happens Pro. Life Happens Pro. This is a program that we put together for NAFA people like the people that are sitting here. It is a subscription resource system that allows you access to everything that we do and allows you access at a discount. If you haven't checked it out, go online, sign up for it, you get 30 days free. And then if you wanna continue, you can just let them charge the credit card. You can pay annual, you can pay on a monthly basis, but the cost is relatively insignificant for what you're going to receive. Everything we do, we get compliance approved, but we do suggest that you go back to your primary company and get it pre-approved again. As I was telling Jill earlier, it's not unusual for the compliance department to approve it, for you to submit it and for them to say, oh, that's not approved because it's a different compliance person and their system doesn't cross check. So to be safe, do that. And I'll show you a little bit more about compliance as we go through. So we have two websites. Lifehappens.org, that's the website for you to send your clients to. That's the consumer website. And lifehappenspro.org, that's the site for all of the professionals in the industry. Two different sites, two different purposes. And we're just in the process of revamping the site to make it much more user friendly. That will happen in the next couple of months. Now, all of you should know about Liam, Life Insurance Awareness Month. The spokesperson we had last year was Danica Patrick. We had her for three years in a row. And she was doing public service announcements for us. In the United States, there are about 10,000 public service announcements per year. Danica's PSA ranked in the top 7% of all public service announcements from all industries. Over the three year period, it hit 1.7 billion who had an opportunity to either see or hear her announcement. The industry wanted us to change to a new person this year. So we have selected a new person. It's a she in the entertainment industry. It's a name you will all recognize. Unfortunately, she has not signed the dotted line as of last night. And I was just on the phone with her yesterday. So when I have that, we'll make an announcement. But I think you'll find this is somebody that can, you can all relate to. She has two teenage kids. So it's not just a story about life insurance. It's about her parents and it's about taking care of the family. It's about the financial journey. It's about the financial planning. So it's a multifaceted story. You're gonna be very pleased with it. One of the things that we have to learn I'm doing okay time-wise, right? Who's got my, my cards? Oh, okay, great. Need to put my glasses on so I can see you back there. But then I can't read anything down here if I put my glasses on. <laughs> Questions to ask. Questions to ask. Business issues, family and life issues, life insurance, investing. Different types of questions for different types of purposes. So what do you do or say to make the prospect aware of his or her planning problems? We have to ask the who, what, when, where, why questions. Open-ended questions that can't be answered with a yes 
or no. We want to make them speak. We want to make them talk. And we want to make them feel uncomfortable. We have to make sure they understand that there is a problem that they have that requires a solution which we can provide. Not necessarily that we ourselves will find that solution because we have to work with other advisors. So when I'm doing this, I'm using a flowchart. This is my flowchart. Actually, it was developed by one of the guys in my study group probably 30 years ago. And I've revised it over the years. And yes, this is compliance approved. So it's not an issue. If you want a copy of it, just let me know. Actually, NAFA has this in their system. They can send you a copy of the slide. But it explains your areas of expertise. So I am the Feldman Financial Group. How much of what you own is really yours? We work on analysis, design, implementation, and monitoring in three basic areas. Wealth present to say, yeah. Wealth presentation, prevention, preservation, sorry. I said I can't read it that far away. Employee benefits and investments. And we are experts in, and I just read down through each one of those. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for a spot where the client will say, well, what does that mean? What are we going to do? I've got all my estate planning. I really don't need that. I've got all my pension planning. I really don't need that. But they might stop me and say, but what is, what is this second, first one down where it says non-qualified, I can't read it from the side, non-qualified pension plans, yeah. I can't read my notes because they're too damn small and my glasses aren't strong enough. <laughs> it's what happens when you get older. You can't see out, you can't see close, you just can't see. But the story goes, I'm from Florida, so I can't see, I can't hear, I can't sit, I can't stand, but I do have my driver's license. <laughs> Let me tell you a story about that. I was going through this with a client, not a client, a prospect. Somebody else had brought me in on a case. They were trying to get this person to do something and he wouldn't do anything. So I went through this and he asked me about the non-qualified pension programs. New York Life calls them slurps. Any New York Life agents in here? Yeah. Supplemental life insurance retirement plan. All it is is a max funded life insurance program. Could be traditional whole life, custom whole life, variable life, can be anything you want, but max funded. And as I'm going through this, I'm saying, well, you've maxed out all your pension programs for you and your employees. Yes, I have. Well, if you could put more money in and do it just for you, would you do that? Yes, but I can't do that. Well, if I could show you a way that you could put more money in, you wouldn't be able to deduct it but it would accumulate tax deferred and you could take it out tax free, would that be of interest to you? He said, yeah, I'd love to do that. My next question was, well, if you could do that, at what rate would you want to fund that each year? And he said, I'd put another $40,000 a year in. Found a problem, found a solution, found the premium. All I had to do was come back and say, well, let me put that together for you and I'll come back and show you how it works. And that's exactly what we did. And this person bought a max funded life insurance program, which he now looks at as his personal pension program over and above everything else. Very simple solution, easy way to do it. A flow chart like this or something similar that's approved by your company really opens the door for people for questions. Speaking of questions, we've got a little bit of time. Anybody have any questions? Because I do have these books that, that I'm not taking back with me. Anybody? Want to ask a question on anything at this point? Young lady from New York Life. You have to, I can't come down to you, so you've got to come up here to get this. Okay, the flow chart. Wow, that's really loud and I'm really loud, sorry. Um, how effective is it? How often do you use it? What would you say your closing ratio is when you use it? Okay. The flow chart is extremely effective. And for every new case where I've sent out a pre-approach letter or I'm making my first presentation to those people, this flow chart is used in every single case. It gives me a track to run on. For those of us that have been around long enough, we can remember being trained on the old whole life policies, live, die, quit. Compliance probably wouldn't approve that today. But that's what we were trained on. 
we had a track to run on. This is my track to run on. It allows me to show them everything we do, to ask the questions, to find the problem. Guys, you don't have to take pictures. We'll make sure that NAFA sends it out to you. It's also in my book, which I'm going to hand out. The other thing about this is they may ask you something about disability insurance. Well, I didn't write disability, but I had other people in other companies that were wholesalers for disability. So I would pick up the phone and I'd say, I'm going to bring in my disability expert. We're going to sit with you. I'm going to bring in my pension expert. We're going to sit down with you. I'm going to bring in my health insurance expert. We're going to sit down with you. It wasn't me. I didn't sell those products. I was a guy with blinders on. I was only interested in selling life insurance products and securities. I knew I could talk about those issues, but only enough to really get myself in trouble. So I'd bring in an outside expert and we'd split the cases. I'm a firm believer in sharing cases. Much better to get something than to end up with nothing or give the person some misleading information, not that you meant to, but only because perhaps I didn't understand it properly and make sure that this client gets what they want. You wanna make sure you develop a client, not a customer. You understand the difference between the two? A customer is somebody you deal with once and you never see them again. A client is somebody that you see over and over and over. You want to build client relationships, not customer relationships. You look like you have a question. So how do you handle a client that says, oh yes, I've got life insurance and it's provided through my employer group and they think that's enough? One of the great ways to answer that is to say, have you ever run a calculation to determine how much you really need? They might say yes, or they might say no. I say, well, I have a suggestion for you. And I had a client that was referred to me. New York Life sent somebody into my office. They had been transferred from California to Florida. In the process, the company he was moved to cut his group insurance in half. He came in saying, I only want to replace my group insurance. I said, well, let's find out how much you really need. In my mind, I knew what the number should be. But I said, if I tell him this, he's going to get up and walk out the door. Because I was thinking a seven-figure number. He only wanted to replace about 150000 of term. I sent him to the Life Happens website, which has the life insurance calculator. And if you're doing that, you can put it on your phone, you can put it on your website, or just send them to it. Let them put in their own numbers. It will tell them how much life insurance they need to solve their particular situation. Then it's their number, not your number. And this person that came into my office, not only did we end up buying a million on him, he bought a million on his wife, and he bought a $50,000 whole life starter policy on his brand new son. I didn't recommend any of those. I would have. But he came in and told me what he wanted to do because of the calculator. So if you get somebody just like that, that's what you do. And if you have it on your phone, if you have it on your phone, just say, here, run the numbers. It just works so incredibly well. One of the things to bear in mind is, and it was just published again the other day, um, the old rule of thumb is you have to have five to 10 times your income on life insurance. In today's low interest rate environment, that is not sufficient. And if you look at the 9-11 commission, the 9-11 commission was recommending time as much as 20 times income based on human life value. So we really need to think in terms of human life value, not just what they're currently earning, to determine what the true amount of life insurance is that's required. Other questions? I'll move on. I've got 15 minutes. Question in the front. Were you talking about from a retirement standpoint? From a life insurance needs standpoint, you're telling me you're I'll repeat the question. Yeah. So. so from a life insurance needs standpoint, you know, what do they really need to get them through a full life experience? Are we, are we telling them the, this is that, actually I'm saying this is benefit that's due if you're going to do it. Are we telling them the amount that the family's going to need to be able to invest to live off? Okay, so you're asking, uh, the question is, are we selling an amount 
that's going to be systematically reduced or are we selling a capital block that will be left over for the family? In almost every case, I'm selling a block of assets that will generate income that will then be an inheritance or a legacy for the family or to maintain the business or to give it to a charity. So we're not doing planning for liquidation purposes. You know, how much would a million dollars last? What do you have to have at a certain interest rate? How long will it last? We're not doing that. We've got a block of money and if we want X amount of dollars, if I need $120,000 a year and I, I assume it's gonna be three or 4% per year, safe money, how much do I need? I need X millions of dollars to generate 120,000 a year. That's the number we use. And we might start off with a combination of permanent and term, but we're trying to solve a permanent problem. So I need to be able to come back and say, we need to convert this. We need to make this a permanent solution. As long as cash flow is there, we can do that because you're not spending any money when you're buying a permanent policy. You're taking the money from this pocket and you're putting it in this pocket. It's like moving it from the savings account into a money market account. It's the same thing. The money's not gone. Yes, there's some opportunity cost on the money. Big deal. But for that, you're getting millions of dollars of protection. So yeah, my philosophy always was to create the capital that would continue well beyond life expectancy, not just to draw it down. Other questions? This is for you. Question is, how do you get over the situation where, where they're being told by other advisors or, or what they read in the paper, buy term and invest the rest? My people typically have permanent problems, not temporary problems. And what we're trying to do is to show them, and you can do this historically, show them that most people that invest for the long term, they typically buy high and sell low. So when you look and see that the market has had a eight, nine, 10% rate of return, if you look at most people, they normally have a two, three or 4% rate of return because they're buying and selling the wrong products at the wrong time. I'm not telling people that they should not do their own investments. We, I mean, we did investments too. So we did pretty well over the years. But what we're saying is that we want to make sure, we want to guarantee that if your investments aren't there at the time when your family needs it the most, we will create the cash that your family needs at the time that it's most required. We create cash where none existed before. That's what life insurance does. Term is a temporary solution. Less than 2% of term ends up as a death benefit. Less than 2%. And most of it doesn't convert. Depends on how you run your practices. So if you're talking to somebody and you want to make sure that they've taken care of everything that's needed, thank you. She was telling me I've got 10 minutes. If you want to make sure that you've taken care of everything that's needed, you can't look at just a five year or 10 year term because the problem is longer than five or 10 years. And if you're talking to somebody who's older, maybe a 20 year term isn't a solution also because they can't buy a 20 year term. They're too old. They have to have something else. So there are lots of creative ways to buy permanent insurance and reduce the cost, but still have it as permanent insurance that will be there for their lifetime and will pay out when it's needed the most. You want to make sure that the product you have lasts longer than you do, not the other way around. That's the problem with term. So yeah, you hear that all the time, but historically most people don't do well when they're doing their own investments. So it's, yeah, you're always going to hear that. And even today with some life insurance products, it's a great place to put safe money. Annuities are a great place to put lazy money. Anybody know what lazy money is? Lazy money is money you've got in a savings account that's earning one-tenth of 1%, one two-tenths of 1%. Chase Bank currently is paying two-tenths of 1% on their, I think it's on their money market. So why would you want to do that? Let's put it to work someplace else where it's gonna earn you more and you still have access to all the money. There's so many products that we have in this industry that will do that. If they really understand what we can do for them and we tell them properly, make sure they understand the story and we know they've got a problem and we're gonna present the solution, 
is if we've done it properly, they'll buy the concept. And the concept is what we're talking about. It's the concepts that we want to talk about, not the solutions. I mean, excuse me, not the illustrations. We want them to remember why they bought, not what they bought. Remember why they bought, not what they bought. So here's an example of one of those concepts. If you can read it, you told me you'd spend your whole life trying to make me happy, and the husband is saying, I didn't expect to live this long. <laughs> the concept is, you may live too long, you may outlive your money. What am I referring to here? Annuities. Annuities. Make sure that we provide the ongoing lifetime income stream that this couple is going to need. And yes, John, I will send you this. So let's talk about some other concepts. And remember, we want to sell the concepts, not the products. We want to sell packages that are designed to solve the problems, to solve specific needs. This is what insurance really is. It's discounted dollars, dollars for pennies apiece, dollars for future delivery. And that's what I've got here. The 1% solution. What am I talking about? Anybody know what the 1% solution is? I'm going to show you a picture if you don't know the answer. All right, let me come back to that. Life insurance and retirement, we already talked about that. Salary continuation, part of the things that we talked about when we were in the business cases. And a concept that works very, very well is to put me on your payroll. So you're working in a business case and the people say, we really can't afford your premium. Now you know they've got the money, they just don't wanna pay it. So the question is, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, how much do you pay your janitors? How much do you pay your line foreman? How much do you pay your administrative assistant? Well, if you were to hire one more of these people, just one, would it make any difference to your bottom line? And the answer is normally no. Excuse me. The answer is normally no. It would not make any difference to the bottom line. But Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, if you put me on the payroll, the day that you walk out, the euphemism for die, the day you walk out, I'm going to walk in with a million dollars tax-free or 500,000 or 10 million, whatever the number is. And when you put it in perspective, they look at that and say, oh, well, that makes more sense. And I can't tell you how many cases I've closed over the years by asking them to put me on the payroll. And that's what's going to happen. The next question they always say is, well, can I deduct you? No, you can't deduct me, but you can try. Any questions on any of the concepts? Once again, they're in my book. That's what I'm handing out next for questions. Oh, she's going to get the first book. Yes. Yes, excuse me. Yes, we do discuss long-term care. We discuss critical illness. But once again, I normally... Yes. That's all incorporated into that. And, and what we find... Yeah, come get your book. And there's a whole section about long-term care in here. And you've got Deb Newman here as, as a, an exhibitor. She's one of the most renowned long-term care specialists in the nation. So if you have any questions, go to her booth and ask. So I've got five minutes, so let me finish up very quickly. We talked about the 1% solution. This is the 1% solution. This is the three cent solution. Million dollar bills and three pennies. The pennies represent the cost per dollar. So if you're talking to somebody who's maybe in their 30s, 40s, 50s, what's the cost per dollar for, for a dollar of life insurance? It might be two cents, three cents, four cents per dollar. So what I'm telling the client is, you can buy my million dollar problems, my million dollar solutions, excuse me, for three cents a piece, three cents per dollar per year. And all the three cents you give me, I'm gonna put into my pocket over here. And any day you want them back, you can have them back. And unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that section, but I, I will do that afterwards. I carry this with me. I carry these million dollar bills with me. I've got some in my wallet, I've got some in my briefcase. The point is, they're gonna say, are these real? The answer is no, but I can make them real for you. Let me show you how. It's really important that you remember how to say it and how to use it. I can make them real for you, let me show you how. 
I'm going to show you the flow chart qu very quickly, and then we're going to finish up. This is the compliance flow chart. You can see right at the top, it says chief idea killer. At the very bottom, it says manager of new sales ideas. That's currently vacant. And then you've got all the people in between that are the VP of no and the VP of status quo. When you're, when you're working with your compliance people, remember, this is what you're dealing with. What's important in compliance is to make sure they understand why you're presenting the particular solution that you want to show your client. Many times they don't understand it. They just automatically say no. But if you take the time to explain to them how it's going to be used so they can see that there's really no problem, then they'll, they'll, they'll let you to do it. They'll let you do it. Of course, you can always ask for forgiveness. If you do enough business, they'll let you get by with that. Uh, one last thing, because I know we're almost at the end. Uh, you keep in touch with your clients. The Life Happens organization creates thousands of social media pieces for you to use. You don't have to create them. We create them for you. All you have to do is post them. If you're on the Life Happens Pro, we have an automatic system to allow you to post them. I will tell you that I always did things a little bit differently. We used to send out Christmas cards. Don't do that anymore. We used to send out Thanksgiving cards. Don't do that anymore. We used to send out Christmas gifts. Don't do that anymore. What I do is I send out Halloween cards. How many of you send out Halloween cards to your clients? How many of you send a Halloween card to the client's gatekeeper, the secretary, the staff people, the ones that let you in the door? I can tell you, if you send them a Halloween card, it will set you apart from everybody else. And I go into the Hallmark store and I just clean out the rack. And I send all these out every year and they are so appreciated. Don't send out gifts anymore because the gifts are not appreciated. I've had clients call me up and say, Marv, don't send me anything. I get so much stuff from so many people. There isn't anything you can send me that's of any significance. Just don't do it. And we spent a lot of time and effort trying to come up with something. One year, we sent out a glass dome filled with shredded money. It was supposed to be the equivalent of a million dollars of shredded money. And it worked great until we sent it to a banker. We sent a bottle of glue with it. I forgot to tell you that. as a do-it-yourself kit. And he sent me a note and said, Marv, I put this together. You're $100,000 short, please remit. <laughs> we stopped sending that. But now what we do is we send a letter to all of our clients at Christmas time, and we say, we have made a contribution to these charities in your name. And instead of client ignoring the fact that they got a gift or calling us to say, don't send us a gift, now they call us up and thank you for being so considerate and making a contribution in their name. So I'm gonna skip through some slides. She's telling me I've got one minute left. But we have to earn the trust of the client. So this is one of our social media posts. Can you see it? Be the reason somebody smiles today. And with that, I have to close it down. I will be around the rest of the morning. Lots of ideas that we didn't get through here because I had to shorten the presentation because it's being televised live. I hope all you guys and gals out there enjoyed it. If you have any questions, I'll be around. Please come up and ask me. Thank you very much. And I have two books left. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, Marv. And I'm going to turn it back over to Zach in Falls Church, Virginia, before our break. Thanks, Clint. And once again, thanks, Marv, for your presentation. That was really great. Uh, before we take a break, for break, we have another polling question for individual viewers. What state are you viewing today's program from? What state are you viewing today's program from? Please use the polling function on your screen. You have two minutes. Now we will take a 10 minute break and reconvene at 10, 15 a.m. sharp. Thanks so much.
And sorry, we, we must have missed you uh, on the on the relay, Zach. So we are here late on that, and I apologize. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce our Nathan National Liaison to the state of Iowa, a fantastic friend of this uh, organization association, absolute hard worker, John Wheeler. Good morning. Everybody's alive and well and awake, and it's a good day. It's not snowing. There's no ice, right? It's all good. All right, so buckle up. This is called Fast and Furious Sales Ideas and Concepts. So uh, this typically takes a little longer than the time we're allotted, so I apologize in advance if we go a little too quick. All right, first of all, the secret of getting ahead is to get started, according to Mark Twain, so let's get started. First of all, we got two people in a hot air balloon that they're crossing the country. They say, where are we? So they drop down a little bit and they see a guy suit in a gray suit carrying a briefcase. And they said, hello, where are we? And the guy said, well, you're in a hot air balloon. He said, who is that guy? Well, he's either a tax attorney or a salesman. So well, how do you know? Because what he said is 100% correct and 100% irrelevant. Now, how much of the time do we start out and we present the solution before we even know what we're trying to solve? So the challenge is prescription without diagnosis is malpractice in any field. So what we have to understand is we have to, first of all, find out is there a problem that the client is looking to solve or is there something that they're wanting to accomplish? See, there's a difference between knowledge and intelligence. Too much of the time when we first start out in the business, we say, well, if I just knew more and I just presented more, well, it'd be simple. Well, see, the thing of it is, knowledge is knowing in tomatoes or fruit. Intelligence is knowing that you don't put tomatoes in fruit salad. So let's get some intelligence to go along with our knowledge. And let's talk about what our products do, just like Marv said, instead of what they are. The average person does not want to buy life insurance. If someone calls your office and wants to buy life insurance, the odds are very good they're uninsurable. Because anyone who can't would buy all they could get. The bottom line of it is, if I present a solution to something that you're concerned about and you want to take care of, and it just happens to be life insurance, would it really matter? So see, here's the real perspective of things. There's a number down there on the ground, right? We're on two sides of that number. One says, hey, this is a six. The other says, no, it's a nine. Well, just because you're right doesn't mean I'm wrong because you haven't seen life from my side. Now think about that for a minute. Isn't that really what happens in a lot of interviews? We come across and we say, here's what you ought to have, and I whip out a solution, and boy, doesn't this look good, you ought to have this. Not having a clue what you even are concerned about, what you don't want to accomplish or anything else. So when we can get ourselves on our client's side, and you'll hear a lot about questions because a lot of this uh, presentation today is based upon what are questions that are open-ended questions, like Marv said, that will get a client to open up and talk about what they really want. See, if we give a client a chance to talk, they will tell us exactly where they itch. And when we know when they, where they itch, then we know what to scratch. See, if we start out and we just present an illustration, well, the premium, unless it's ultra cheap term insurance, always looks too heavy, doesn't it? Premium's too big, why? Because we've started out with a solution instead of that. Think about if you went to see your doctor and before your butt hit the seat, the doctor said, well, you need Prozac. Well, they might be right, but you would have probably felt a whole lot better if there would have been a little more diagnosis up front. Now, on the other hand, if I haven't established the need or the desire for the insurance, the premium looks way too heavy. But when I talk about what it does, and now you might have to sell your home. You might, your kids may have to leave their school and leave their friends. Not gonna have the ability to pay off student loan debts. And look at the impact on your lifestyle. Look how much lighter the premium keeps getting. See, the average person spends more money on a cell phone bill today than they do life insurance. What's wrong with this picture? When I started in the business almost 50 years ago, when I was four, we didn't have cell phones. We had a, a rotary dial. 
I mean, if you wanted to talk on the phone, you had to be there. Now all of a sudden they can track you down anywhere. So if I start talking about the solution too soon, it becomes a problem. Here's a question I ask in almost every client situation or prospect situation eventually. Would you be willing to give me all your future paychecks for the amount of life insurance and assets you currently own? And within seconds, 90% of the time, they say no. Then I say, are you aware that's what you're asking your family to do? See, well, our job is, is to help people realize what they already know but don't want to think about. The more zeros we get to the left of the decimal point, the easier it is to get confused. See, it's like this when Benjamin Franklin went to see the king and he said, but sire, it's not really a horseshoe nail. He said, for one of the nail, the shoe was lost. For one of the shoe, the horse was lost. For one of the whore, the rider was lost. For one of the rider, the battle was lost. And all for the one of a horseshoe nail. It's not the nail, it's what the nail does just like life insurance or disability or anything else. See, there's two types of life insurance. The kind where the premiums increase and then the coverage stops, or the kind where the premium stops and the coverage continues for life. Which one do you prefer? Pretty simple. But simple doesn't always mean easy because we have a tendency to confuse it. Or have you heard about the new term insurance? The old term insurance is actuarially designed to expire before you do. You look at anybody's term insurance and look at the cumulative premium and the cumulative premium will typically exceed the death benefit anywhere from three to seven years before life expectancy. And life expectancy is nothing but a simple average. So if you tell me when you're going to die, we'll price things just exactly right, but if you can't commit, I can't either. See, the new term insurance is actually designed to last as long as you do, no matter how long that is, and it's guaranteed to never increase in premium. So at the end of the day, which type of term insurance would you prefer? There's a, a, a guy from the forum that <laughs> says it this way, that he said, do you want the term insurance that costs money or do you want the term insurance that makes money? Because all it is is a term. A term might be how long you pay it. Or how much life insurance should I have? Anyone ever been asked that? Now, the calculator on life happens will do the same thing. Sometimes you might not be to where you're getting reception or whatever, or maybe you're not a techie. I've done this on a cocktail napkin for years without a computer, and people understand it. And I've probably sold more insurance with this concept than any other single thing. First of all, how much do you want to have set aside for final expenses? Unless you've got a prepaid burial and so on and so forth, there's a cost, right? What's emergency fund? Emergency reserves, most experts recommend somewhere between three to six months in expenses be set aside so you're not thrown into debt if something bad happens. Then we got mortgages and debts. I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. How much money would it take to be able to pay off all your mortgages and debts? You notice I didn't say to pay off, I said to be able to pay off. That way we don't get into the great debate about, well, I've got a low interest rate, I don't know if I'd want to do that. Well, having the ability to do it is still a stronger position than not having the ability to do it. Fair enough? And then education. How do you feel about education for the kids? And don't forget the surviving spouse. Because what would happen if I said, would your surviving spouse be able to get some additional education and as a result be able to be more self-sufficient? Now, am I really on the behalf of the client? Absolutely, I'm showing them all the ways. I'm asking questions, I'm not telling them what to do. And then if these things were taken care of, how much of your income would still need to be replaced and for how long? Now, if I inflate up and discount back and use all the other expansive computer programs, this will be plus or minus 10%. Now, outside of that, all there is is any maybe additional tax, legacy issues, if I have philanthropic desires, add that in, subtract what you've got, what your liquid assets is, that's an easy number. It's a starting point. We have to win the battles before we worry about winning the wars. See, Mark Twain again said it this way, the two most important days in your life is the day you're born and the day you find out why. 
we were talking earlier about when are you going to retire? Well, to me, retire means tired again, retired. So why would I want to retire from something that I feel good about what I do and I can help others think about things they don't want to think about and probably wouldn't take care of without me? So as long as I can add value, why wouldn't I? First concept, Marv talked a little bit about this. In one respect, I'm going to take a different spin on it, put me on the payroll. Let's say that you're going to hire an employee to fund your retirement. So what if you were to hire an employee, pay them the current minimum wage? Now this, of course, is going to vary from place to place. You can adjust the numbers. It's easy to do. And what if the only job that employee had was to help ensure that you had enough income at retirement to live more comfortably? And what if that employee never took a vacation, never called in sick, doesn't need a medical plan, no 401k contribution, and what if I told you that the minimum wage that you paid them, they're going to provide you almost as much or in some cases maybe more than what you paid them during that time for your retirement? Well, that may be of interest. So let's say that you hire an employee at eight and a quarter an hour. Now, most places today, minimum wage is going up above that. If I'm out in California, I'm going to be way above that. And, you know, even most places around here are going to be at least 15 within three or four years, if not already. So just adjust the numbers. So at eight and a quarter an hour, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, that's $70,160. So they work for you for 10 years. Now, during that 10-year period, what if that provided you almost as much tax-free income from the A for 35 years, from 66 to 100, as you paid them every year during the 10 years? Well, that may be something you'd be interested in. When did I use the word life insurance? Now, do you really care what it is or do you care what it does? So if I took a 45 select male non-tobacco as an example, and I put a 10 pay annual premium of 17,160, that means I paid $171,600 over 10 years, right? Then I'm going to start tax-free income from age 66 to age 100 of $16,685 for a total of 583,000 plus. 171 for 583, that wasn't all that bad. We've all made worse decisions. And oh, by the way, if you died then when you're 100 years old, there's also another $41,000 income tax-free death benefit that comes in even after you receive that 583. Or if you died on time at age 85, the death benefit will be 381.5, which means that now there's money that comes in to your family to replace part of what you spent while you were alive. Not a bad concept. Well, now what happened if that employee worked for you for 20 years? Over 20 years with the same scenario, same amount of money, 17,160. Now I'm paying 343.2. Now my tax-free income is going to be $26,047 a year for 35 years. So you pay 17 for 20 years, and you get 26 for 35 years. Not bad. And oh, by the way, yes, there's still a death benefit at age 154 or at age 85 of 488,000. Not that bad, right? What if you had additional cost? Now, most people that are going to hire an employee don't just have payroll only, do they? You've got Social Security. That's 7.65 on the employer side. So 7.65 of the 17,160 is another 1,300. Now, also, you're going to have GL and workman's compensation, depending on the business and so on and so forth. It's probably going to be at least another $500 a year. And then that doesn't possibly even include normal retirement contributions that you might be responsible for or medical 401k benefits or whatever. So now with the new numbers, it's now 18973 a year as a minimum. Same scenario. Now I'm going to have tax-free payments of 18450 if I paid them for 10 years when I paid 18973 for only 10 with a death benefit of 45 at 100 or uh, 399, almost 400,000 at age 85. Now, as the minimum wage goes up or whatever you're going to have to pay, guess what? The numbers keep looking better and better and better. And like Mar said, would this really bankrupt you or cause a serious problem if you hired this other employee? And oh, by the way, while you're owning this, 
You could even use this for other purposes. If the bank told you no, you can always get this. And if you pay yourself back as well as you would the bank, it will still continue to make money as if it were still there. What if they work for you for 20 years? Again, same scenario. Obviously the numbers do nothing but get better because as we know, when the premium goes in, the more premium there is, economics 101 says the greater the rate of return is the longer the money's there. The last year is the biggest return. Second concept is what I call the blackjack approach. So how much life insurance would you acquire if you could only get it for the use of your money? So in this example, we've got a 55 year old male, select preferred non-tobacco, million dollar 10 pay with waiver premium, so it'll be self-completing during that 10 years if something were to happen and he would become ill or injured, unable to work. Premium's about 69,000 a year. 10th year death benefits a million 277. So during that acquisition period, again, if he paid 690,000, a million 277, almost doubled his money, he's made worse decisions. But now what happens if he starts pulling out over the next 10 years, the same amount he put in during the first 10 years? Now he's playing with the house's money. He has no skin in the game. And as a result, with no out-of-pocket costs other than the use of the money, now the 20th year death benefit is still $583,000. And at age 85, if he dies on time, 679, and he had no skin in the game at all. Not bad, right? Simple concept. Third concept, how many of you are PNC agents? Multi-line as well. If you use this concept, you'll increase your business 30% next year. Fair enough? All right, so how many of your clients could properly explain to you how their auto liability works? I'm talking about at least two days later, <laughs> right? All right, so let's say that I'm crossing the street. The brakes fail on your car and you run me over and I'm heaven forbid killed or seriously injured. What do you think my wife's gonna sue you for? Everything she can, at least a million dollars or all over the board, right? Well, now you've got a 100, 300, 100 liability. Now do you know what that means? They're gonna look kind of starry eyed the most of the time. Well, I don't really remember. Why don't you explain it to me? Well, what that means is that since only one person was injured, being me, that your insurance company is going to pay up to $100,000. Now, do you know where my wife's going to come to for the rest? You. Up to all of your assets, and in most states, up to 25% of your income. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't really feel very good about that, right? So, now I'm sure that your current auto insurance agent has already explained this to you. And see, if you aren't the current auto insurance agent, you just put them out of the business. Because if they didn't take the time to explain to you something that could be solved for really pennies on the dollar and bring light to something that could put you in the poor house, do you really want to trust the conversation of your financial security with them on a higher level? So if you just increase that to the minimum underlying of 250, 500, 100, which is what most companies recommend or require for an umbrella, then you'd qualify for an umbrella, which might be two to $300 a year. So would that make a lot more sense instead of taking the type of risk that you are? Fair enough, easy conversation. When I was doing multi-line, 78% of my book had umbrellas. Now, what does that mean? It means that the courts understand human life value. The consumer oftentimes doesn't. Why would a court award these large amounts? For the simple fact, the income is no longer coming in. So, now that you've insured somebody you don't even know for at least $1,250,000, I'm sure you've got at least that much for your own family, right? Do you have any clients that don't have a million two hundred fifty thousand dollars of life insurance? I bet you do. Easiest transition in the world. Let's say that your car was destroyed in an accident and your policy had lapsed. Would you walk for the rest of the time, or would you go find a way to get a new car? 
Well, now, doesn't it make sense to have alternative plans in place just in case something were to happen and you were out of the picture? See, otherwise, you're just like the man who was walking along the street in a snowstorm and he came to the barricade and it said road closed and with no alternative plan, he just stood there and started getting covered up with snow. It's always good to have an alternative plan. Fourth concept, workman's compensation. Uh, are you currently paying compensation for your company, for your employees? And do you realize that most states do not require that you have it? You can post bond and you can post cash and so on instead of that. I'm not saying that's the preferable way. I'm not saying it's a normal way, but it is the law in most states. So what happens then? Uh, they hold you responsible if something happens to one of your employees, right? That's the whole reason we have workman's comp. Nothing went wrong. It's just like most forms of insurance. It was a cost. So you can self-insure and accept all the risk yourself, but that doesn't really make a lot of financial sense, does it? I mean, when you can for even with higher work comp rates compared to the risk, it's higher for a reason. It still makes sense to have the insurance. So if that doesn't make good financial sense, then doesn't it make even more less financial sense for you to have risk your income that might stop in the event of your death or if you became ill or injured, who's gonna pay your bills? Don't you agree? All we're doing is asking questions. It's all in the questions. So besides you, who would pay bills for the uh, business and provide for your family's needs? Do you have a trust fund set aside that's gonna take care of everything for you if something goes wrong? Do you have someone else that's gonna come in and pay the bills of the business without asking you anything for it or someone else gonna take care of your family? And after all, what's your business really worth without you? Because if your business is worth as much without you as with you, we've got a real problem, don't we? So which would you prefer to acquire, assets or liabilities? Well, especially if I'm working with CPAs, this is one of the common questions I ask. In fact, recently we were working with a farmer who had a $5 million operating loan for his farm. And guess what the bank required? They required 5 million of insurance. So he had 10 year term insurance. He's in his fifties. He's paying a little over $60,000 a year. And I said, uh, tell you what, have a, a meeting set up with your banker and their supervisor, we're gonna come in and buy lunch and just have a discussion. Okay. So we went in and I said, uh, which do you typically prefer for your clients to have, assets or liabilities? They said, well, assets. I said, but you're requiring my client to have term insurance, isn't that right? Well, yes, that's for the bank examiners and so on, so we're protected, but I said, isn't it true that if he doesn't cooperate and die, over a 10 year period, he's gonna be $600,000 lower financial statement than he would have otherwise. Isn't that true? Well, I never thought of it that way, but yeah, I guess. And I said, you're giving him a $5,000 operating loan to plant a crop that you don't even know is gonna grow. If it grows, you don't know what it's gonna be worth, but you're okay giving him $5,000 for a risk like that, right? Well, yeah, I guess. And I said, well, why wouldn't you be willing to give him 330,000 more per year to plant a crop that's guaranteed to grow that would still provide the security for the loan in the event something happened. And at the end of that 10 years, he's at least got all of his money back and still just as strong on his financial statement as he is. One of the bankers threw up his pencil in the air. He said, I'm gonna go home and tear up my term insurance right now. And I said, not before we get something else in place. So both bankers ended up being clients as well. It's just a matter of explaining things in a way that people can understand. How many of you have joint income households? Pretty common? Here's a question to ask. Which income do you currently save? What do you think the answer is most of the time? Neither one. So when they say neither, then in other words, there'd be a financial loss if something happened to either one of you, right? 10 to one says, if you don't ask that question first, they'll feel that, hey, they're good. Hey, if the mortgage is paid off, got no problems. Well, the income that just went away is probably more than what the mortgage payments are, so where's the rest of the money? Did they spend it all on themselves? 
But if you ask this question in advance, you can put things in perspective before it becomes a, a, a problem. See, I don't believe in stress management, I believe in stress prevention. So if we can eliminate a problem before it exists, it makes it easier to deal with. So how would you like to uh, decrease the current taxes on your savings? Are there ways we can help with that? Absolutely. How about increase your overall rate of return? Like Myra said, if you've got that money market account at Chase, you're making two tenths of a percent on, I bet there's almost anything you can show is gonna beat that. Or increase the asset transfer to your heirs. How many times have you come across a client and I've got a CD or something over here? Well, what's that for? Well, you know, it's just kind of a rainy day situation in case I ever needed it, but the primary thing, I want it to go to my kids or my grandkids, right? Can we multiply the effect of that without them losing control? Absolutely. How about be able to use your money while it's still growing? If we take a loan against a whole life contract, does that whole life contract guaranteed cash value increase still be the same next year? Is the dividend still going to be paid? Yes. Have your savings to continue if you were unable to work because of an illness or an injury? Unless I've got special disability coverage to cover my 401k or IRA contributions, how much of your savings would continue if you became ill or injured and unable to work? Well, if I've got waiver of premium on my life insurance, it will. And do you know what your health's gonna be in the future? What provisions have you made to prepare for possible health issues? We were talking earlier and you know, the bottom line of it is if I look at the expense of long-term care and what that risk is or disability or medical expenses, that's one of the highest risks I run. And the older I get, the greater the odds are it's gonna be bigger. So if I don't make preparation, you know, the old definition of, well, I guess I was just lucky. Well, the definition of luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So who's gonna pay for it? And will your financial future, or future financial security be jeopardized because you didn't make proper preparation? How many of you ever left baby, babysitting instructions? Right? Why? Why do you leave babysitting instructions? Well, something could happen. I need them to know who to call. I need to know what's supposed to happen. What type of babysitting instructions would you leave if you might never come home? I mean, if we think enough to leave babysitting instructions because we're going to the show or going out to dinner, doesn't it make sense to leave instructions for the financial security and well-being of our family on a longer basis? See, so here's some business leading questions, again, if you're operating with business owners. What do you wanna have happen with your business when you retire or something happened to you? A lot of times we get so bu busy building up the business that the train starts running faster and faster and we don't know how to get off. So again, doesn't it make sense to have more preparation in that regard. Who besides yourself is capable of running the business? Great open-ended question, because what's this tell me? I'm gonna get one of two answers, either nobody, or I'm gonna get a name. Now, if someone is capable of running the business, if something happened to you, what did I just identify? A key person. And what have you done to keep that key person here because if they're that good that they can run the business if you're not here, what are you doing to be sure they stay here? Now see, I don't call them golden handcuffs, I use fur-lined handcuffs. It's softer and sweeter and <laughs> it's easier, right? So who do you depend on the most? Again, just another way of the same thing. Even if they're not running the business, how many businesses rely heavily on someone to do a certain task? or a certain part of the business that they might be capable of doing, but it's the last thing that they wanna do. And do I want them running away? Because if they're a good quality employee, everybody's looking for the same thing. They want somebody that's dependable. They want somebody that is going to operate that business as if it were theirs, keeping the consumer's interest in mind, but still looking out for the company as well. One of my favorites. When's the last time you took six month vacation? What do you think the answer typically is? Never. 
What would happen if you did? What would happen if you were gone for a year? What's the common answer? I wouldn't have a business to come back to. Well, what would happen if you never came back? And what preparation have you made to take care of those situations in the event it could happen? So does your family have adequate income outside of what the business provides? How many businesses that you work with plows back the majority of the earnings of the business into the business to keep it going or growing? And pretty well the sole source of revenue for their family is the business. And if the cat's away, the mice may play. So if they're not there overseeing and watching and seeing that everything gets done, unless they have that key person who is really capable and they put those fur lined handcuffs on them so they won't go away, how stable is their financial situation? What plans do you currently have in place? And if you became sick or injured, how long could you pay yourself? Now this isn't only a business question because the average individual that we talk to is anywhere from 30 to 90 days away from financial ruin if the paycheck stopped. Is that a position you really wanna be in? How would you feel about driving a car out on the expressway in a snowstorm with no body around it? Just the frame and the engine and the transmission and here we are cruising along. Would you feel okay? Take a go-kart out on the expressway in a snowstorm? But don't most of us take a lot more risk than that in everyday life as well? And if you had to take in a new, a new associate, would you rather pick your per the person yourself or would you have your deceased associate's executor pick them for you? Or in many situations, I die with an I love you will and my spouse just became your new partner. How do you feel about that? You might like my wife, but that doesn't mean my wife can do all the tasks necessary to keep the business going. Also, is your will consistent with the desires that you have for your business? Unfortunately, unless we get into a true fact-finding scenario, we find out if they have a will, it may very likely be nothing more than an I love you will that in the event of my death, everything goes to my spouse. Well, that's great, but if I don't have a buy-sell agreement and I've got a partner, how does my partner feel about that? My partner just became their new partner. Is that really consistent with what I want? Or is there a market for your business if you weren't part of the package? I mean, we heard uh, the presentation from Cornerstone yesterday that very vividly talked about, hey, the time to sell is when you got a buyer and the time to sell is when business is at high, not when it's a low, well, how and when do you identify that? Giving up control is the biggest problem most of us have. And will the laws of the state determine the disposition of your business? See, everybody's got a will, at least one. You either have the one that you wrote or you have the one the state wrote for you called the laws of intestacy, or in some situations both because you didn't have a residuary clause. So at the end of the day, is that consistent with what you want or even if I can't decide, well, you know, I don't know really who I'd want to name as guardian for the kids. Well, if you don't know, do you think the court's better chosen to make that decision for you? You can always change your mind. You can always review it after the fact. Don't you think in almost every situation, it's better off you making your own decisions in some, instead of someone making them for you? And if you and I were having this conversation three years from now, what would have needed to happen for you to feel like you're making progress in your journey? It always pays to review and reflect. As the great philosopher Yogi Berra says, if we don't know where we're going, how can we be sure we're not already there? So it always pays to review things. Some business facts. Marv talked a little bit about this. This is primarily with family businesses in the fact that more than 75% of all private businesses, that's the non-public business in the U.S., are dominated by families. About 40% of them outlive their survivor. And out of that, only about 15% survived to the third generation and only about 1% to the fourth generation. 
but still yet more than 50% of them could have been saved with proper planning. So let me help you be sure that yours is one of them if that's what you want to occur. Now see, another decision that, or another approach that sometimes we do inappropriately in business planning is we assume that the business owner wants the business to continue and we're writing a prescription for that when they may not. So we need to be sure what their goals and objectives are first before we start writing the prescription. But in many situations, if I've spent my whole life building this business, especially a family business, ideally I would like to see it continue. But I need to find that out first before I start writing the prescriptions. Is your current co coverage cost effective or is it just cheap? Because see, cheap things have no value and valuable things don't normally come cheap. See, we need to find out if your insurance is cheap or inexpensive. There's a big difference. At the time of a claim, when's the last time that you suggested a coverage that you thought a client should have and at the time of claim they didn't have coverage and now all of a sudden it wasn't cheap? So if that claim occurs, if it's sump, pump, and sewer backup coverage, or if it's flood coverage, if it's even earthquake coverage, or disability, or life insurance, you know, I'm 35 years old, I'm going to last forever. I'm bulletproof. I had a 35-year-old client that missed the Olympic trials by two-tenths of a second. This guy looked like Adonis. It was disgusting. <laughs> he had this square jaw, and he'd take off his shirt and had a 12-pack I mean, guys would look when he took his shirt off. This is just how sick it was. Well, you know what? Inside, he didn't look the same way. And he was a health nut and all this, and then he'd eat wheat berries and all this other stuff. And, oh, geez. <laughs> you know, grow up green stuff. And, I, oh, that looks like something out of The Exorcist. And this is what he's drinking. And still yet, he starts feeling run down. So he goes to the doctor. He said, well, maybe I've been working out too hard. Came to find out he had lymphoma cancer of the lymph glands. Didn't matter how healthy he was for that. Doctor said he'd lived for five years, he made it three. So we don't know. None of us know what the day is that our card's gonna get punched, which is why we need to make every day count that we're here. Let's talk about the squirrel. I mean, even the squirrel's got enough sense to put nuts away for the winter, even though they don't know how long or how bad the winter's gonna be. Doesn't it make sense for you to do the same? Or the chicken and the egg. Now, if you had a chicken and an egg, which one would you insure? Actually, it makes sense to insure both, right? Because after all, if the egg doesn't hatch, you're not gonna have any more chickens. If you don't have the chickens, you're not gonna have any more eggs. And still yet, you are the chicken to your family and your income is the eggs. Doesn't it make, sure, doesn't it make sense to insure both of them as well? See, sometimes I use kind of squirrely analogies because they will pay attention because they don't know what's coming next. <laughs> but still yet, when you use something that they can maybe relate to a little easier, at the end of the day, I don't have to look smart. Because again, if I look smart, that might be counterproductive. At the end of the day, if I can help you achieve something you want to achieve, isn't that really what I'm supposed to be there for? I can't care more about you than you do. And I tell my clients, with all due respect, I don't have to live with the results of your decisions you do. So that's why you need to be happily involved in knowing why you're doing what you're doing and understand what you're doing. How about the cash register? Let's say at, uh, you found out that in your local supermarket or your shopping center, you heard there's gonna be a huge cash register placed out there on Saturday. And then starting at 10 o'clock, people could line up in the line to line up in that cash register, and they could carry away all the money that they could carry. Where would you want to be in that line? Well, unfortunately, you're not at the front of the line now. There's lots of people ahead of you. You've got all sorts of payments before you can save a nickel. Wouldn't it make sense for you to put yourself up to the front of the line and at least start saving something for you today? And then as you can afford to increase it, start saving more as time goes by. See, every day you procrastinate, it gets harder to do the same thing. 
Or how about the money printing press? See, when we go to DC two or three times a year, I walk by the treasury and as Tom Hagner would say, you can hear cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. They're printing money. Well, we can't legally do that. But what would happen if you had a printing press, a printing press in your basement that printed money? Well, if you did, would you insure it? How much would you insure it for? All the money it's going to print at the least, right? So for your family and your business, basically that's what you are, is you are that printing press. So look at the amount of money that you're going to earn between now and when you stop working, and tell me that's not a bigger number than what you give yourself credit for. So doesn't it make sense to insure yourself for just as much? So at the end of the day, you can carry a chart like this, or you can just take a solar powered calculator. If you're good at math, you can figure it out. What's your current income today? All right, I make $5,000 a month. I'm 40 years old. Well, $5,000 a month, that's $60,000 a year. If you're gonna to plan to retire at 65, that's a period of 25 years. That's a million five you're gonna bring home. Not only are you the million dollar person, you're the million and a half dollar person. Now, what that number represents is you never got a raise for 25 years. Would you be happy if you worked the next 25 years and never got a raise? So in other words, that million five is actually a lower number than what realistically you're gonna bring home to your family, isn't it? But it makes it easy to understand because if I just say, how long are you gonna work? What, how much money do you make? Easy math, simplistic. At the end of the day, we get closer to our goal. See, according to John Ruskin back from the 1800s, the common law of business says, it's unwise to pay too much, but it's worse to pay too little. Because if you pay too much, you lose a little money, that's all. But if you pay too little, you sometimes sacrifice or lose everything because the thing that you bought was incapable of doing the thing it was bought to do. So if you deal with the lowest bidder, which is what some people always wanna do, it's well to add something for the risk you run. And if you do that, you'll always have enough to pay for something better. Like I say, when are you gonna die? If you tell me when, we'll pick exactly the right thing for you to have, but if you can't commit, I can't either. Here's the other thing for you PNC people. Uh, even if you don't use PNC or don't sell PNC, you can still use the same thing. Uh, Jill, I know that you deal with property and casualty. What's the average value of the cars that you insure? 45,000 the average. And roughly what does it cost to insure that 45,000 the car as an average for a collision and comp? 700 a year? Okay, so 700 a year for something that's worth $40,000. Now, next year, is that car gonna be worth more or less? Less, so how much is your insurance gonna go down? Not much, might even go up. Well, that sounds kinda like a losing proposition, but $700 is not a big deal, right? All right, what's the average value home that you insure? About a million, and what does it cost to insure a million dollar home? 1,300, and since you've been in the business, how many people have had a total loss of their home as a percentage, high or low? Very low. So in other words, you're paying $1,300, not for a million dollars, but probably for something less, is really what you're gonna gain from it, right? All right, so if you're paying 1,300 for something that's a million, that hopefully is going to appreciate, but you're paying $700 for something that's worth $40,000, it's not gonna be as much later, then if, uh, what's the average income of the clients that you have? 65, and how many years are they probably gonna work? Yeah, yeah, just as an average. All right, so 20 years, that's a million three if my math's correct. So if you got something that's worth a million three, now you were paying $1,300 to insure something that's worth a million, but you're probably never gonna get a million from. Now, Jill, it's important that you understand that 100% of us die. That's a pretty strong statistic. 
So if you're willing to pay $1,300 for something that might be worth a million, or you're gonna pay $700 for something that today's worth 40 and over time is gonna be worth less, then I'm sure you're probably paying somewhere around thirty-five to forty thousand dollars for life insurance for yourself, right? But it's simple logic, isn't it? Or then we go down to the same thing down below. If you had something again like my printing press, it was generating sixty-five thousand dollars a year, and you said you'd insure it. Uh, that means that you're insuring as much of that $65,000 as you can in the event you became ill or injured, right? Are all your clients doing that? No. But again, it makes an easy discussion. Fair enough? See, all I have to do is to give them an opportunity to do the right thing. And if they choose not to do the right thing, I've got a very elaborate, complex form that's called a disclaimer. And it says, the following coverage or coverages have been recommended to me, and I wish to not acquire them and accept all the risk myself. We handwrite what it is, I sign it, they sign it, and it goes in the file, they get a copy. Now, sometimes they will, what's that about? Well, that's to protect me against legal liability. Because in the event that something did happen in your income stop because of an illness or an injury, or you didn't come home, I don't want to be in a position that as your professional advisor, I can show your family where I tried to do my job. It was your decision. Big difference. And 60% of the time, the conversation will reopen when you do that. Which job would you prefer, job A or job B? Job A pays $60,000 a year in the event you became ill or injured, pays nothing. Job B pays $57,000 a year, and in the event you became ill or injured, is gonna pay about $37,500. Which job would you prefer? Well, unfortunately, you have job A right now if you don't have disability coverage because the difference in that 57 and the 60 just happens to be the premium that would provide that 37.5. 18 second disability presentation. Or my favorite, because this one is mine, this one I stole from Bert Mizell years ago, is the two elevators. You got a choice on getting on two elevators. Which one would you prefer to get on? First one or second? So you said the second one, why? It had three cables instead of one. Well, unfortunately, you're on the first one now because that first cable represents your income, and if your income goes away, your financial security just crashed and burned. On the flip side of it, with the three cables, it would be your disability income and your waiver premium. Who would you prefer to disinherit, your family or the government? And what have you done to be sure that you haven't done what you intended to do so? And are you sure your assets are gonna go where you want them to when you die? See, all of us have got three choices. Everybody's got the same three choices. The people of our choosing, which normally include our family, charity, or the government. And even if you don't like your family, surely to God we can find a charity you like better than the government. So wouldn't it pay to review your situation? Do your great-grandchildren know your name? How many of you can tell me what the name of your great-grandmother or grandfather was? Pretty low percentage. Well, I bet you if you were getting a check every year, you'd remember it. So if we set up a 60-year-old uh, male, let's say he's gonna have uh, three grandchildren, we set up a 10-pay whole life for 7,800 a year, just using dividends alone as a free withdrawal of $3,000 a year, on their birthday, they get a check from that trust that we set up. Or if we set up a single premium annuity to fund it, then we could save 7,300 to fund it and only 700 and some odd dollars a year that's taxable. I bet when they're getting that check every year into infinitum, they'd remember your name. Somebody say, I love whole life, you bet you. So which would you prefer, the opportunity to be rich or the guarantee you'll never be poor? See, the insurance industry is the only one that can guarantee you're never gonna run out of money. Do you have any clients nervous about the market or retirement? Well, let's say here was the JP Morgan chase up until September 30th from the last downturn in the market was up 331%. Unfortunately, that last quarter looked a little different 
and it ended up 271% because we lost 19% in December alone and the S&P ended up losing 4.38%. So as a result of that with a market risk alternative, and I'm running out of time here, so I've got to go pretty quick. If I had a 60 year old male that wanted to protect at least a part of their IRA or qualified money, they plan to retire at 65. They're fully invested in the market currently, but they're nervous about it. If instead of a 4% withdrawal rate, which is what we typically would call sustainable, I put them in a DIA, what that would do is if they deferred all the way to age 69, that would guarantee them $47,967 a year for the money to grow to where 4% would equal that 49,000, they'd have to get 10.2 every year in the market. What do you think the odds are in that last period of time they're gonna get 10.2% every year? Or if I had a female with the same scenario, obviously the numbers are a little bit different, but you see the earlier I retire, the less likely it is. So if I take part of the money off the table, put it in an absolute guarantee, it makes it very easy to hedge my bet. Then the money that I'm still have invested for assets under management, they're not as nervous about because they can let it ride. The only difference between death and taxes is that the death doesn't get worse when Congress meets. So what do we sell? The primary thing that we sell is the ability for people to have a good night's sleep. If something bad happens, they don't lose the sleep that will happen, or they won't lose sleep on what will happen to the people they care about. And money comes in at the right time. Dollars walk in when we walk out. So again, if we only focus on the solution, like I said at the beginning, then the client's gonna focus on the price. If on the other hand, we focus on the problem, the client's gonna focus on the solution and they're gonna to wanna to know what they can do to make it go away. No one's ever lost a sale by listening too much. God gave us two eyes, two ears, and one mouth, and we ought to use them in that proportion. Education, if I could show you how to pay it for education, we're running out of time, so I'm gonna go quickly through a couple of these. The average family spends more time on a family vacation than they do in planning that vacation than they do their financial future, is that wise? But here's what I really wanna to get to, here's what we do.
태어나서 정말 처음으로 기도를 한번 해봤어요. 아이를 보니 얼마나 눈물이 나는지. 저 결정했습니다. 이 세상 다할 때까지 우리 아기 지켜주겠다고. 그리고 영원히 사랑하겠다고. And as long as we're here, we'll do everything that we can to provide that. Doesn't make sense that we would make sure that our promises are kept, even if we're not here to keep them. So if you believe in keeping your promises, can you still do that if your income were to stop or if you didn't come home, what provisions have you made so far to do it? So let's review the promises that you've made and the goals that you want to achieve to be sure that you're going to be able to do it. See, nothing is really impossible. The word itself says, I'm possible. So remember, yesterday's history. Tomorrow's a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I'm going to turn it back over. We're here behind, so I'm going to turn it back over to Zach in Falls Church, Virginia, to close out the program. Thanks, Clint, and thank you, John Wheeler. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, we have one more polling question for individual viewers today. Um, name one of the presenters from today's program. Name one of the presenters from today's program. Please use the polling function on your screen to respond. You have two minutes. This concludes our program. So once again, thank you, Marv and John. Uh, thanks to all who have participated today for NAFA Live. And don't forget to mark your calendar for the next meeting on March 21st, hosted again by NAFA Iowa and featuring Rick Cordero of Principal Financial Group. For those who have joined us virtually, this concludes our program. For those who are participating from area viewing locations, we turn you back to your local meeting. Have a great day.